Hi everyone, this is Cindy McDonald. I am your instructor for the UCLA College Counseling Certificate Program. And I have the distinct honor and privilege of bringing experts in the subjects that we study through UCLA to talk about things that are current and pertinent to the work that we do with students and families and just in, in the world right now in general. So I'm very honored today to have with me Dr. Corey C. Miller from Wright State University. And we're gonna be talking about Generation Z and many of the implications that go along with their generation and, and the things that they're facing. So welcome, Corey, I'm glad to have you here. Thanks so much for having me or having me back, I would say. Absolutely. The last time we talked, I think it was five years ago. It was before COVID. It was <laughs> long, you were working on your second book, I think, at the time. And, and now you have four books out and two more coming. And Yep. Yeah, well, a lot happens. I mean, that's the cool part about generational research is we are always working. You, you can't ever get an answer and just sit with it. The next day, something else happens. You're like, whoa, all right. I got to, you know, consider this now. So it's, it is a lot of fun. Keeps me on my toes. Well, it, it, it definitely does. We know that as counselors, advisors, mm -hmm. part of why we love this working with the younger generations. So can you tell us a little bit more about your background and those areas of research and what led you to research Generation Z? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's really funny about it. I have a Gen Z daughter when she was, you know, seven or eight years old, someone asked her, they said, you know, what does your mom do for hobbies? And she says, Generation Z. I was like, well, that's not really a hobby, but I guess it's a passion, right? So, you know, a lot of times we fall into research around things that we care about. And I didn't know that I was going to care about this until I started working with a group of students that just seemed like they were, you know, kind of shifting a little bit away from what I was familiar with in higher ed. And I thought, I really want to understand them because I want to be able to do my best as an instructor, as a, you know, an educator, as a, an advisor, any of the roles that I play for them in higher ed. And I really wanted to make sure that I showed up for them in the way that they needed me to. So really my, my passion, I guess, is my hobby. So my daughter is right. And, uh, and so it was back in 2013 that I first got interested in working with this generation um, simply because I, I saw a shift kind of in the attitudes and some of the behaviors of the incoming class at my university. And it was so, it was so noticeable that I, I actually went and looked up online on Google. I didn't even know what to search at the time, but I looked up all different kinds of things like what is going on with students today? Like, why are they so different? And I came across a generational birth chart and it had Generation Z listed. And I thought, well, who is this? I thought a millennial was like everybody from here until the end of time. And so that wasn't the case. And I decided to look more into them. I didn't know at the time if generational differences would explain what I was seeing, but I thought I might as well take a look. I can tell you, you know, 10 years out, um, a lot of what I saw 10 years ago was a lot of what we found in the research to be explanatory. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so I really just became fascinated with understanding who these young people were and, and it snowballed. It was just, you know, went from my own looking online, what is out there about this generation to doing a study in 2014 and then another in 2017, another in 2019. We did one in 2021 and we just finished one in spring of 23. I'm always looking at understanding who they are. Um, and, and like I said before, there it's evolving. Every time there's some kind of new thing happening in the world, you know, generations, including older generations, as well react and because of that people end up forming their values and beliefs and behaviors and i love studying that so um really i come from like a sociological perspective i like understanding the why people do what they do and i and you know i can imagine working in the in the field of counseling that is something that's also really important is you know what's the underneath right why are people behaving in a certain way it's not just that they're behaving in a certain way i want to know what's driving them to make decisions so i look a lot at things like motivations right values those things that kind of are the underpinning of who people are and that's what drives me to do this work is to understand kind of what makes generation z tick so those are things, though, you can't just put in a cup and say, here's how much you have, right? So how do you measure motivation, values, you know, those kinds of things? What does that turn, what does that look like in research? <laughs> well, you know, we use a lot of self-reported data. And as you know, self-reported data is, you know, biased people overrepresent. But, you know, one thing it is, is while it may sometimes lack in validity, it's very high in reliability because people are, you know, if, if you say, 
you know, how much do you like an apple? And they rate it eight out of 10. And how much do you like a banana? And they rate it seven out of 10. Maybe they don't like either fruit, but that clearly they like an apple more than a banana because in their mind, they rated it higher. So for us, what we do is we capitalize on that human thinking to be able to say, okay, if we gave them a list of, you know, a couple dozen motivations and we said, which ones, you know, motivate you the most, we are going to see something that is a reliable scale on their end of what really does drive them. To what extent, we don't know. How it actually manifests, we don't know. But what we can say is that they prefer certain things over others. And that in and of itself is very telling because people often operate based on their preferences for the world around them, the way that they they prefer to navigate it, right? And so that that to us has been incredibly eye-opening. And so that's how we do a lot of our, our measurements. It's been, it's difficult um, to do other types of mass generational research that isn't self-reported. I mean, almost every market research company and everybody's doing polling, um, stuff like that. And so that's where you're getting that data. But but we also uh, do a lot of qualitative data collection, which is very different than most generational researchers. So we ask questions like how and why. So we are able to get underneath of some of those things. We actually asked a question um, on one of our first studies. We asked about, you know, do you, to what extent do you like working in groups? And we found that overall, you know, there's a bunch that do and there's a bunch that don't. If we would have left it at that, we would have never understood why. We asked them why, either you like working in a group or you don't. And we found things that we would never have anticipated. We found that one of the reasons that a lot of a lot of Gen Zers didn't like working in groups is because, it, you know, the typical things, right? The I don't want to have to carry someone else's workload or, or share the, you know, share the the accolades if we do well and they didn't do anything, or you know, those kind of things, right? That's just general human behavior. But underneath it all, there was this one finding that it was, I, you know, I don't like dead weight in groups and I don't want to be the dead weight. I don't want other people to perceive me as not carrying my fair share. We would never have figured that out had we not asked that question. And so we get a lot of really great um, answers, so much so that our 2014 study was a mixed methods. But when we got to 2017, we did a study called the Stories Project, where we just asked seven open-ended questions, no quantitative other than demographics, just seven open-ended questions, you know, um, you know, basically like things around motivation, learning dynamics, you know, what, what's your ideal career? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? And, and some people wrote one word and some people wrote a whole paragraph. And it takes a long time to read through every single response and code them. But we were able to get an idea of the essence in ways that we wouldn't have had we just done a poll or a, a quantitative survey. So that's part of how we're able to measure that. Yeah. Yeah, I can see where that would add a whole nother dimension to mm -hmm. research. So how did, so you mentioned how some of the research differed from 2014 to um, 2017. What about this most recent one? Um, is that something you're still looking at and trying to go through? Or do you see some differences or things in this most recent um, research that you did? Yeah, I mean, great question. Um, what we ended up doing was uh, the biggest study that we've ever done specific to Gen Z was 2021. That was, um, we are still analyzing data from that study. That was our first attempt at a global study. Mm -hmm. And we ended up, what was really neat, we ended up um, getting, I think I, it was, I got a LinkedIn message from a graduate student in Spain and said, hey, are you doing any kind of research that we might be able, to, I might be able to jump on with and help you? And we're like, well, I don't know, we're going to do, we're going to replicate that 2014 study in 2021 with the, you know, the same students that, you know, or the same group of students in the U.S. She's like, well, can I, can I do that survey in Spain? And we're like, oh, I guess so. We could do like some kind of comparison. The same week, somebody from Australia reached out and said, I'd love to help you with your research. And we're like, huh, do you want to deploy this survey? And she's like, sure. Next thing you know, they knew people, we knew people. We reached out to all the prominent Gen Z researchers around the world. People had authored and done studies on Gen Z. And we were able to, um, to get 81 researchers to, to collaborate with us with formal research agreements, signed papers, like literally formal researchers. And um, they represented 32 different countries. And we took the survey. We had initially designed it, it was from 2014, and then we we tweaked it a little bit, and then we sent it to each group, and we said, can you culturally adjust this so that it doesn't affect the measurement, but that it culturally represents like what you're doing, and then can you figure out what languages you want to offer it in, and then translate it, and they did, and we offered the, the survey in 19 different languages, 
including two different cultural versions of Portuguese and two different cultural versions of Hebrew. And, um, it, or actually not Hebrew, in Arabic, two different versions of Arabic. And it was phenomenal. So we got the data back. And other than the open-ended questions and the languages we didn't know, we were able to do all the quantitative stuff on this global level. We had more than 30,000 participants worldwide. And um, so we planned to write this book and it, it was Gen Z around the world was our placeholder title. And we were gonna write about how Gen Z was different in all these different countries, right? And we ended up getting the data back and it was so similar across every country. It, it was remarkable. I mean, we were just blown away. I mean, there are nuances, uh, absolutely. But overwhelmingly, there's so much similarity and we've broken out by world regions and countries and I mean, in every which way we sliced and diced it, there were far more things in common with Gen Zers than there were different. So we changed the whole nature of the book and we decided we liked the placeholder name. So we called it Gen Z around the world. And we all wrote about chapters about who this Gen Z, we call it the cohort culture, uh, who the Gen Z cohort, what the Gen Z cohort, cohort culture is. And we're able to uh, write a whole book. And that's the one that's coming out in, uh, in, in just a few months. But um, that was our biggest study to date. The study that we're working on now, we're just starting to analyze is actually the first time we broadened our research into all generations as opposed to just Generation Z. So doing a comparative analysis of generations in the workplace. So we're writing a book called A Guide to the Generations in the World of Work. That one has smaller sample sizes because we just simply have more uh, generations represented. Um, and we're looking at very, very specific things like around our professional development and you know work-life balance and, you know, organizational culture. So some of those are really specific for that publication that we're writing. Uh, so that's in the, in the mix right now. So really, and that one actually has no qualitative uh, questions simply because we wanted to collect a, a lot of data um, from across all generations. So we're, we're starting with, you know, basically just quantitative. It's the first time we've ever done a study that doesn't have qualitative questions. So, um, but, but every time I turn around, there's an opportunity to do something unique. Um, and, and contribute something around the, the topic of generations. Wow. Well, and, and understanding, I know part of the value with Generation Z is understanding the difference between them and their parents. And I mean, that's always been an issue. You know, we, we talk about that, I, you know, the baby boomers and Gen X and millennials, I mean, all the differences. So how does that come into play for Gen Z, the difference between them and their parents? How, what does that intersection look like? Yeah, well, you know, as I said before, I do a lot of, um, you know, kind of sociological work with this and, and understanding that people don't just show up, they, they're influenced. And one of the things that uh, is a huge influence is is the generations that have come before and particularly parents, but grandparents and even other generations who have paved the way. Uh, we, we, um, when I say we, my co, my co collaborator, Dr. Megan Grace, she and I um, wrote a book called Generation Z, A Century in the Making. And we unfolded the last hundred years to see like why Generation Z is the way they are today, right? Because even things that happen beyond the parental generation is, is influencing this generation, which is, um, which is really, really, fascinating. We think like who are their grandparents or what, it, what kind of policies were put in place by a certain generation that have a trickle effect. And, um, but as we look at it, you can start to see some, some kinds of themes. Again, not all of this is, is universal. And I always put that out as a caveat. When we look at themes. It's just important to understand what a theme is. And, you know, like the way I really describe it is if you, you know, you're on campus and you're going to build a new restaurant and you ask people if you wanted to serve hamburgers or pizza and 80% want pizza and you put a pizza place in, you're not saying that everybody on campus wants pizza. You're just saying that a lot of people do and it's probably going to be successful and probably a pretty good investment. That's how we do generational research is a number of people probably feel this way or experience this way. So it's good to know. With that said, um, what we've seen in the patterns is that, you know, the parental generation, for instance, of if you go back in time, the parental generation of millennials were um, a lot of them were sometimes older Gen Xers, but a lot of them are baby boomers. And I'm a Gen Xer with a, a baby boomer parent, but most of the time it's baby boomers with millennials. And, um, you know, baby boomers raised their millennial kids to be um, in almost opposite of how they were raised, right? They were raised as like children should be, you know, seen and not heard. And like, they didn't, you know, it was kind of a very formal, you know, structure, a parenting structure. They, and that in turn, turned around with millennials and, and parented in a very kind of friend, egalitarian structure. We see that with 
millennials who are in their 30s who are still looking for workplaces to be more egalitarian because that's the homes for many of them that they grew up in. Um, Gen Xers is the primary, but not sole, the primary parental generation of Gen Z. Um, instead of raising their kids to be kind of whatever they weren't raised as, they raised their kids to be raised similarly to what they were raised as. So if you think about it, Gen Xers, independent, autonomous, latchkey kids, their parent, both parents, you know, going back to work. I mean, at least that's the societal culture at the time, maybe not each individual family. Um, kids, you know, if the kid didn't make the the T-ball team, the parent, you know, the Gen X, the parent of a Gen Xer didn't come and scream at the coach, right? Like, that's just not how it was. It was like, well, then you need to go out and practice. Like, that's the, and so Gen Xers said, hey, you know what, look at me. I'm pretty resilient. I'm pretty independent. I'm, you know, I got my stuff together. I'm going to raise my kids to be very much like that. So you've seen the pendulum swinging back from like a helicopter parenting of millennials to what we call a co-pilot parenting of Gen Zers, where they're basically parents are saying, yeah, I'll, I'll be here with you. I'll help, you know, if you want to consult with me or, you know, I can coach you on a decision, but it's ultimately up to you and you, how you want to do it. So there's been definitely a, a kind of a swing backwards. Um, so much so that I actually was speaking to a group of uh, K-12 educators uh, a couple of years ago who said, that they, when millennials were in school, like the parents were calling all the time, all the time, and just, you know, show, like PTA meetings were just spilled and bustling. And they said, you know, um, now it's hard to get parents to be involved in PTA, to volunteer for kids' events, and some of them just no show to their parents or to their parent teacher conferences. And they said, because they're just so detached in some ways. And so there's not really a right or wrong. It's just, it's interesting to see. And so you have these Gen Zers that are growing up in a time where they're being, um, kind of left to have more independence and autonomy, but they're growing up in a society that is 25, 30 years later than that which Gen Xers grew up, right? So maybe safety is different, right? Your kids aren't necessarily going to go out trick-or-treating by themselves today or whatever. And so as they're as Gen Xers are parenting, they're trying to parent in a way that takes into account that society is just simply different now. And so there's like a balance there. But it is interesting as you look at all these generations and how they overlay, you can really get a picture of why people are the way they are. That's interesting. That, and, it, and it is interesting to watch the pendulum swing one direction and then back the other and, and think about well, what the next generation is going to experience as mm -hmm. well. Um, so how does that affect students like because we're counselors and we're working with these students that are trying to make these life decisions about you know do I go on to college is it worth it to go to college um you know what are some of those types of themes that you see that Gen Zers face as they're trying to make those decisions I mean unfortunately part of it a lot of it is financially driven Mm -hmm. So Gen Zers have a lot of pressure on them to make the right choice when it comes to college decision making, whether to go, what to major in, whether to go to grad school, what internships to take, because frankly, it's very expensive to make the wrong choice. Um, you know, you think about uh, someone in my generation in Gen X, we went to college even if we didn't know what we wanted to do or be because it was a time to explore and we could afford to take a few extra electives and we could you know, see what struck our fancy and all that. It's hard to do that now. College is not only is it just financially expensive, right? Like the tuition itself, but the more time you are taking to take classes, the less time you are working to make ends meet. And so you're, you're, there's two costs, right? There's the opportunity cost and there's the actual financial cost. So that's weighing down. It's like a, a lot of Gen Z here say, I, I don't want to go to college unless I know for sure what I want to get a degree in because I can't afford to waste time and money without knowing that. So um, so there's a fear, a trepidation. And then, of course, watching what happened to many generations before them, particularly millennials being saddled with so much student debt and saying it's only going to be worse for me because college is even more expensive and wages haven't gone up. Um do I really want to do that? And so it's a tough sell. I mean, I always say, you know, when I'm talking to higher ed people, like kudos to admissions officers, you've got a tough job, right? Because what is this return on investment? But the other thing is too, is like what's constantly pulling and tugging at the heartstrings of many in Gen Z, you know, we've, we've asked questions about career a number of times and we find the same stuff. I want a job 
that I feel fulfilled and passionate about. I want a job that I'm happy. I, I don't need to move up the ladder. I don't need to be some kind of big boss and I don't need to be overly wealthy, but I do need to feel like what I'm doing is contributing to society. And I need to make a wage that's going to make me so that I'm not worried about paying my bills. So it doesn't have to be a lot, but it does have to be enough. And the word enough kept showing up over and over and over the word enough. I have to make enough. So it's not that there's this idea that I want to go, I'm going to go into this, you know, major and then ultimately this field that is just super high paying just for the sake of it, because I want to be rich. It's mostly, I want to go into a particular field because I feel like I can make a difference in that, but I also know that I can make a living wage. So the question is going to be, what are those professions? You know, when we see things particularly around, um, say, teaching, for instance, teaching is a very, you know, in many ways, an altruistic profession. People can contribute. They can see the changes that they're making. They're transforming the lives of students. But in most places, they don't get paid very well. And so as a Gen Zer, are you going to take out a student loan to go get a teaching credential and then end up being have student loans the rest of your life? Like, so as a society, we're going to have to respond back by saying, to what extent do we value these things? Because now we have a group of students that are not willing to take that chance like millennials were. Millennials are like, oh yeah, sure. I'll be a teacher. I'll figure it out. And then they're stuck and saddled in all this debt. And Gen Zers are just saying, I'm not sure I can make that choice. And so a lot of them are having to choose between happiness, things that fuel their passions and, and enough money to live off of. And then some are really fortunate. They're like, yeah, I've always wanted to be you know, a mechanical engineer, and you're like, well, that's great. <laughs> you're going to be, you're going to be fine. Um, but for the rest of them, you know, that don't have like lucrative pressure, uh, professions as their passions, that's a big question that a lot of them have to ask. So does that mean trouble for liberal arts colleges then? It, well, it could be. I mean, one of the things that, that I've seen happen over the last five, seven years, particularly with in, well, not even just liberal arts colleges, but, but degrees in the liberal arts, is positioning them to be able to be feeder majors to higher paying jobs. Um, so for instance, in, in the tech world, uh, tech world is all, almost always recruiting for English majors because they need people to be able to write tech manuals. They need to be able to write how to you know, use this platform. They need people who can do those skills. And so I think um, liberal arts for the sake of liberal arts might be a tough sell, but if you can tie it to a profession that has a paycheck associated, like a you know, a particular paycheck, um, that might be helpful. It, much to the dismay of the liberal arts, you probably don't necessarily want to do that. But at the same time, if there's not like a pipeline to something, it, it, it is because it's been, it was a hard sell 40 years ago, 50 years ago um, to get a philosophy degree. It's going to be that much harder now. But if you can say, oh, a philosophy degree, if you want to go to law school, this is a great pathway. Um, and and I, I I'm you know I almost choke on my words as I say this because I believe in the higher education is about expanding the mind, not about professional preparation. But at the same time, when you're asking people to put out that much money, they need to know that they're going to be able to reimburse themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I know a lot of liberal arts schools and colleges in general, higher education in general, really expanded and enhance the, what they offer in their career center for that reason, because that's such a stated um, goal of Gen Zers. And um, I know coming from the technology background, you know, one of our best people that we hired was an Italian major. And people will ask, you know, what are you going to do with, you know, a degree in Spanish or Italian or whatever. Well, she, who better to help explain a foreign language like technology <laughs> to someone yeah. than somebody who's taught, been taught foreign language. So she, oh. so she now makes six figures in the tech field with an Italian degree. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. so I think that that's part of what our role is as counselors and advisors is to help students you know, understand some of that and also ask those questions as they go visit those campuses. You know, how do you help me make that next step and that next level? Mm -hmm. But I definitely see um, that concern and many of us see that concern in our students of the financial. And a lot of times it's self-imposed. It's yeah. not the parents saying, oh, it's to, you know, be careful. We can't afford it. The parent, the students are telling us as counselors, you know, I don't want to put my family under, you know, an undue financial hardship or something like that. So, so that's a big aspect. 
What about diversity? That's another aspect where I think Gen Z has had much different experience and perspective. So what did, what did you find on that in terms of how do they define diversity? Well, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, I remember the whole debate when I was, you know, in college and it was like, is diversity something to be tolerated or accepted or you celebrate it? And but diversity always had to be something that you did something with. And then now, you know, in the professional world, it's like diversity is something that you train for, you hire for, right? Like you're always doing something with diversity. That's what we're told. Um, it's like a commodity of sorts. And Gen Zers don't really see diversity like that. And I've been trying to wrap my head around that because it's fascinating. They just say diversity is just who we are. Right. You don't have to do anything with it. Maybe not discriminate, but like there's... Right nothing like it's a value it's a strength it's great we're diverse there we go um you know make sure that we have an, an equitable equal inclusive playing field right that's you know those those pieces but it's not so much like we have to like craft or do something with it and you know and, and that's not to our detriment as older folks you know that we've had we've done that because it was our way of wrestling with how do we try to create inclusive spaces and, and gen z just has a very different way of of looking at it. Inclusion is is really just being open and welcome to people and, and finding a way to, 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 again, even things out where they have been uneven before. Um, so that's one aspect of it. But you think about part of it, where it comes from is, you know, this is the most uh, racially diverse generation in US history, 49% identify as non-white. So um, that's part of it, right, is, is identifying as someone who might be in what would be considered a marginalized community. Um, but also just the diversity extends beyond race. Uh, you know, we see um, a lot of, we see, well, with, with race, we see multiracial, right? We see more multiracial. We see a lot of um, Im immigrant children. If you look back into the early 2000s, there were surges of, uh, you know, international immig immigration, you know, adoptions. And those kids are now in college, right? And they're, so they're immigrant children with most of the time white parents in the United States. So, so we're seeing other types of, it's, even though it's a form of racial diversity, it isn't just like here are the categories of race and here's who we're seeing and these are the percentages. We're seeing a lot of kind of um, fluidity with that and um, complexity. But we're also seeing other types of diversity, uh, you know, like um, continuum-based non-binary diversity. And we, when I say non-binary, a lot of people think of just gender. This idea that you can, you know, gender identity, gender expression, and it's somewhere along a, a continuum, right? Um, it, but sexual orientation is a non-binary. People, you know, kind of slide on the scale wherever they feel like, and sometimes they're not even on the scale. But we also see non-binary with um, with things like religion, where we're seeing people as not necessarily I'm religious or I'm not religious. It's on this kind of scale, and maybe it, maybe it ramps up at a certain time. They just had a death in the family, and they get, get reconnected with their with a faith, and then it tapers down and their identities around religion fluctuate. So there's a lot more like less categorical diversity with young people um, than we than we're probably used to. So that's that's another aspect is when you're when you are are diverse or you're coming from you know a, a background that might not be you know kind of normalized in society, you're gonna of course probably see the world a lot differently when it comes to what does diversity mean. But even further on our very first study in 2014, we we asked a question about uh, what what is your biggest like social concern, and we got back um, all of these responses that were all about I'm really worried about things like racism and sexism and all that kind of stuff. And they went on to explain a lot of them, actually the vast majority of them, that they were worried about those because of people that they knew and loved. Like I'm not gay, but my brother is, and I'm really worried that dot dot dot. And it was a very interesting that a lot of them kind of came out with this ally-like behavior and, and attitude. So, so not only are many of them, you know, you know, kind of in these relative diverse spaces themselves, they're really advocating for those that they love and care about as well. And so it's, it's, it's a very, it's a much more kind of um, complex view of diversity. And, and, you know, there's a lot more that can be kind of intertwined with that. But I think those three things in and of themselves just the fact that they define it differently, they they have more diversity in their own demographics, and the fact that they have this connection to supporting and loving their marginalized friends and family members. Those three things alone are just something that's a little bit different than us and older generations are probably used to. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. That's well. And it, it is, I, I mean, I see that and I think we see that as counselors too, and our students and um, it's much more personal that diversity mm -hmm. is you explain it's just it touches them in a, in a much different way um one of the other aspects that i know that you discovered and that we run into a lot as counselors the older generations like go to college go away go you know go to another <laughs> help her another place and you know here's your time to do this and we find a lot of gen z are saying um i'm good i'll just you know i'll stay within 100 miles or you know 200 miles and stuff from home and so what some of the things that you're talking about probably explain part of that orientation or behavior that they have of not going far away is not as big of a goal or value as it used to be yeah well i mean this is a generation that again they're the, you know, again, not universally, but but thematically are close to their parents um, in ways that they've seen their parents as their coaches and their mentors and their guides. And some of them don't really want to be that far away from from that. Right. And, and not that they're not a phone call or a text away, but some people just want to be able to have that um, that connection and, and be able to, you know, kind of have it at their fingertips. So there's there's part of it is that uh, I it, there's a great study that it wasn't our study, but it's we reference it in the book. It's about um, seeing your parents as role models. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was, the vast majority of Gen Zers see their parents as their number one role model. But you get all the way down to Gen Xers and only 29 percent of us are her parents as role models. So, I mean, and then millennials are like smack in the middle of that. And it's like interesting as to how you feel connected to your parents. It wasn't that I didn't love my parents and they weren't great, but they didn't, you know, I didn't feel like I needed to, to connect with them. They weren't my source of kind of coaching and, and mentorship. And so I, I could easily walk away. So part of that is, is that reason as well, but you know, the world is so interconnected anyways. And if, you know, you have a, a Gen Z or says, I'm going to stay closer to home and maybe go to college here, I'm going to save money, right? A lot of them stay close to home because it saves money. They can live at home or they can maybe go to a community college for a little while, or even just stay at an in-state school. Um, because they're still going to have a new experience. And in the way that with social media and the way that it works is you could, you could live in California and go all the way to New York and go to college and you're still texting your best friend from high school, or you can go to your state school in California that's half an hour away and you're still texting your best friend from high school that went to another state school. So the, the idea of community is, is not as big as we used to. It's just like it overlaps. So you might as well pick the option that's close to the people that you love, the community you love, and maybe that's a little bit less expensive and maybe a little bit more familiar. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, well, there's so many topics we could talk about. <laughs> and I could talk forever. So, <laughs> But um, I do want to touch on some of the most recent events. And one is, um, you know, especially from the Supreme Court, they just um, struck down, you know, the student loans. We mentioned that a little bit, the payment for, you know, the, the basically forgiveness of student loans. Um, we're dealing with that, um, last year's ruling on abortions, um, what, how is that going to impact those, those kinds of things impact what we see, um, in Gen Z? Well, I mean, there, there's, there's two, if you look at the kind of the, the, the most obvious kind of external level of it all is Gen Zers are a lot of times the demographic most affected by these rulings. Yep. Right. So you look at the like abortion ruling, someone who's, um, you know, in a in an age period of time in which they could get, you know, become pregnant, unlike a 60 or 70 year old who's voting on these things or who's a judge on the court, um, they're going to be impacted by their ability to have access to to abortion. So that's one. Same with affirmative action in college admissions, same with the student loans. I mean, a lot of these things are impacting, have a, have a greater impact on younger people. So that's the, the first and foremost, and that's going to have an, an immediate effect as that takes place. I, I think a bigger, and I, I'm going to say a bigger issue to really be thinking about with this that we're not, is that this generation has in many ways lost faith in, in, in much of humanity in terms of what older folks are doing. Um, even back to our 2014 survey, we had response after response. It was like older people don't have any our idea, you know, our best interests in mind, or they're ruining the world, or why are why are these people who are only going to be alive for 20 more years buying, you know, getting plastic bags at the grocery store, knowing that my generation is the one that's going to have to figure out how to dispose of them? Why, why, why? And um, 
we actually asked this question again in 2017. We asked it again in 2021, and it just became more so. And it's not just from the U.S. In 2021, we found this is happening all over the world. Young people are losing faith in older people being able to make sound decisions on their behalf um, around climate, around social justice, around the economy, around education, around healthcare. I mean, it, it is so pervasive that we have a generation that is either going to do one of two things: they're going to become detached. And in some ways they did. If you look at the if you look at the election uh, turnout in 2016, both in the US and in the UK around Brexit, young people didn't didn't show up as much. And a lot of it was, I don't, I don't even want to participate in this corrupt system that is just ruining the world. And then they realized that, oh, I better participate. So in 2020, they came out and so forth. So they're either going to retreat and just give up on all of it, or they're going to push back and say, I want a system that does something that's more fair and more equitable because I'm literally watching things go backwards. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the quotes was, you know, we're in a state of social regression. And they're right. They're one of the only generations that have actually seen groups of people who previously had rights have them removed. Think about it. In all of the US in like at least the last hundred years, we have seen things progress. Groups getting more and more rights. We haven't seen, you know, you know, they came, Gen Zers came of age and transgender people in the military. And all of a sudden transgender people can't be in the military. And then, you know, women had, you know, a right to an abortion. Now women don't have a right to an abortion. And they're just watching this. They're watching what looks like society go backwards. And they're frustrated. Even when we looked in 2019, we did a study on political ideology. And even when you look at people who identify as Young people who identify as politically conservative, they are also incredibly concerned about the backwards movement of social policy in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so that is a real, that's a really big thing. So not only are we going to have the impacts of these rulings on young people, but we're going to have the continued loss of faith in the system that maybe will mobilize them to get up and, and you know, do something about it. But it's it's hard. It's just like anything else. Like you, you leave it on the shoulders of the people being affected to be the ones to fight back and do something about it. And it's, it's all of our jobs to, you know, make sure that we, we leave our society better than when we took it over for the next generation. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that older people will heed that call. Right. Yeah. So that leads me to my last question, which is what advice do you have for us as advisors or parents? Um, how can we do that? How can we help to make it be better for them or pave the way for them or communicate to them? What, what advice would you recommend? I mean, one thing is I, I think we, and we're doing, we're, th this is happening with a lot of folks and people are doing a really good job, but I think we need to listen to them more, um, you know, because we're so used to just telling them, right? But obviously we have a lot of problems we haven't figured out and it might be time to turn over the reins to some young people with some fresh ideas and that aren't as, as like as exasperated at how difficult a fight has been you know and say you got some new ideas let's just roll with it and not be not have our egos in the way of saying we tried that before and it didn't work or you know those those kind of things parents say that teachers say that employers say that and just saying well, what what do you think like you have a fresh perspective um, I think we also need to um, be able to provide assistance in skill building and networking to young people who have great entrepreneurial ideas. They want to change the world. They are changing the world. Many of them have invented things. They've started their own businesses. And we need to help provide ways to um, give them as much of an opportunity to develop whatever they need to be successful in that as possible. Um, I've been saying it since I been doing this work in 2013 is that every college and university should have a gen ed class on introduction to entrepreneurship, period, period end. Most of these students are going to be and are entrepreneurs. Why are we not helping them? Why is that not a general education thing? In some schools, you have to be a business major to even take an intro class on entrepreneurship. Why is that not something we're doing? It's we, We've got to be able to respond to, to what they're doing. They're going to start businesses with or without us. They're going to invent things with or without us. They're going to change the systems with or without us. I, I would rather be a part of that so I could help than be an obstacle for them. And so I think just, you know, as well, although it isn't like takeaways, like it isn't like here are three things parents can do. I think it's just an attitude, right? Like an attitude or an essence of support, willingness to listen, um, that coaching and mentoring, that being able to, to do this together. What do we need to do? How can I help? I think that's where we need to be. And a lot of people will say, you know, oh, you cater too much to young people. It's, you know, they have to pay their dues and we had to pay our dues. And I don't believe in dues. I don't believe in dues. 
I think it's foolish. And I think if something didn't work for one generation, you don't replicate it just so that they have to go through it too. You, you learn from that and you change it and you say, you know what, young people have a lot of momentum and they have a lot of ideas. Let me, let me jump on and help. And I'm not going to feel um, shamed or embarrassed because I didn't come up with it and I'm older and wiser and I probably should have. No, I'm going to be inspired by that. And I'm going to help with that. And I'm going to leverage their potential the best that I can. So that's really what what I think we can be doing as parents and educators, advisors, teachers, you know, any anybody who's who's working with parenting with or supervising Gen Z. Oh, I love that. I love that. And, you know, and that connects back to authenticity as well, because the students are going to be authentic. And, mm-hmm. you know, we if we have that open minded perspective and um, give them that opportunity, show me what you've got, show me what you can do. You know, we can be very, very surprised. And um, Mm -hmm. there are many programs out there, but they're, you know, bringing more of them. And we as parents and as advisors can help um, foster that and, and generate interest and enthusiasm and support you know, for our students in those areas too. So Mm -hmm. Dr. C. Miller, thank you so much. This has just been so fascinating. And if someone wants to reach you, how do they, what would you recommend for that? Um, Well, they can reach me on my website at coreycmiller.com. And you can find lots of, lots of things on there. I've got a lot of resources, videos, podcasts, article links, and so forth, but also my contact information is on there as well. And then also, I always say, follow me on social media, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm a Gen Xer. I love LinkedIn. So anybody who's listening to this who's not a Gen Xer, you're probably thinking, I'm not never getting on LinkedIn. But get on LinkedIn. That's where you can get some good professional connections. And that's where I spend most of my time. Well, good. And you're starting an institute, or you've started an institute for yeah. all research as well so they I'll put the link to that in uh, the show notes as well but that's another place that they can learn a little bit more about what your the work you and um Megan are doing and and as that move forward so I'm I'm anxious I'll get on your (laughs) pre-order excellent um so thank you very much Corey yes thank you for having me